Hello everyone, welcome to Rural Water Resource Management. This is NPTEL course week eight, lecture one. We have been looking at what are the methods in which rural water resources can be managed uh, and in uh, particular rural water resource management in India. In week seven, um, what we looked at is the hydrological water balance we define the unit of analysis, which is the watershed, and how to determine the area. If we remember, we had the water balance equations. However, the equations have to be placed within a boundary. And that boundary is known as the watershed boundary, which is our unit for analysis. We looked at what are the methods in which we could determine the watershed area, and what are the key points in setting up a watershed area or a boundary. And then we looked at how we could quickly assess the watershed area or quantify the watershed area. In particular, we looked at how GIS can help in watershed area delineation and calculation. Even though watershed area using GIS is the best, one of the best uh, methods, Due to the um, focus of the course, we did not get into GIS methods because that itself is a course on its own, GIS and how to use um, mapping tools, etc. So with that understanding, we are moving into week eight, where we look at rural water um, management issues. So in order to manage rural water, it is very important to sensitize ourselves on what are the issues. If we claim that there is no issues, then there is a problem. And that is what we need to avoid in this course um, and look at how we build um, a, a narrative on rural water management. So we start with water is important, what are the water issues and the specific issues for rural water management. And then we build on what are the methods for rural water resource management. So specifics on how to improve water management will be discussed this week. Uh, issues on capacity building um, and um, why is it present in some regions and absent in other regions would be discussed. Uh, we'll define what is capacity building. And when I said the previous point specifics on how to improve water management, there are management plans, but they are not efficient enough or uh, they are not um, holistic enough, which means bringing all the components of water together. So we will look at how we could adjust that. Infrastructure related issues, we would look into uh, some major infrastructure related issues that uh, either are absent or not taken into account of. And we would then get into maintenance and ownership issues. Okay, so uh, how do you maintain these um, um, units is, is a question. And then how do you take ownership um, for, for each and every aspect uh, is a question. Okay, so we, we would discuss all these in detail and most important is the data issues. In order to manage a water resource, we need to monitor it. And then the monitoring is based on the data that is collected. If we don't have monitoring, you cannot manage it well. That is a, a very strong philosophy that I believe in. How do you manage something? How do you uh, quantify something if you're not measuring it. So once you monitor, you measure, and then from measuring, you become a more efficient in management. All this is from a field hydrologist perspective, which means I am a field hydrologist. I work on the field. I collect data from the field. So maybe uh, some can call me I'm biased to data, uh, but the understanding is um, uh, you need to know how much water it is. Just thinking, looking at rainfall and assuming um, groundwater level is not going to work. In those days, maybe the demand on water was so less. So monitoring and the data collection was not needed. But right now and in the future scenarios, water is one of the most, if not the most important resource of the planet. Remember that 
people are going to outside um, so solar um, within the solar system they're going to outside planets in search of water because that is the determinant that drives life form okay so um, my course would be from a field hydrologist perspective which means how do you measure on the field why is measurement needed and from the field how do you convert it into a desktop uh, database and from the database into a model and then from model to management plans or advisories a small recap of the last uh, figure that we saw in figure 7 okay in figure 7 what we looked at is um, what are the uh, water balance components and in which months or seasons do the soil moisture uh, occur, which means your plants are consuming more water you need to give some other additional resources for plant growth uh, and where are the months for example where soil moisture accumulation is happening uh, and groundwater recharge is happening this is when the rainfall is more than the plant can take so the excess water would go in okay so other than the hydrology itself which is captured well in this um, um, graph uh, of rainfall and plant water dynamics or plant water requirement what are the other major issues that can affect water management because in the rural setting we say that Rural water uh, management is uh, important, agriculture crop is important, uh, storing groundwater is important and recharge is important. However, if we don't quantify the other aspects driving these changes, uh, which are not readily graphable like this, uh, then we are losing on key information that can change the story of water management. So that is what we'll be looking into in this uh, week. Rural water management for water security is important. So water is not only domestic use, which we drink. Water is not only your crops and agricultural activity. There are much more things that need to be taken into account. And once you have enough accountability and water available for every uh, key priority, then it becomes a fully water secured system. So. How do you manage water for water security is the key for rural water management. So this is the uh, UN's um, uh, diagrammatic representation of uh, how water security can be achieved. Okay? What are the key players for achieving um, water security? What we have um, is um, the capacity of uh, population to safeguard sustainable access to adequate quantities of, of acceptable quality of water. Here, we are not looking at water quality because water quality concerns are big, you know, and without data, it is very difficult to even debate on water quality. So right now, we just look at quantity and what this UN water body, which is a, a vertical in the United Nations system just for water. Okay, so how they, they manage water, what is water, um, how do they promote water security, so all these uh, aspects are discussed in the UN water vertical. And according to them, water security is uh, the capacity of population to safeguard sustainable access to adequate. So it's about how people can access water safely and guaranteed access. Okay? So they say that it is for all these four key sectors and it starts with your drinking water is safe and equitable water available for all? Is it affordable? Safe means is the water clean, good quality, uh, and is it equitable water available? Not like one portion of the population gets more water than the others, uh, because it's all of us are human beings. We all need X amount of water per day. So saying that only one uh, population gets more water is not correct, okay? So that is where this equitable water comes. The, the, the separation could be within the village, uh, within a street, uh, within the nation. Uh, so how water is being separated is a big, big question. So is safe and equitable water available for all? That defines drinking water security. So you can put a tick mark saying, yes, water is secure in these region. And is it affordable? So you might have water. And, and a very clean water, but if you're going to build them really, really expensively, 
then it is not going to be sustainable. And that doesn't count into water security. For example, your bottled waters. Okay? Not all people can drink bottled waters. Nowadays, you see bottled waters are much cheaper than uh, initial days because the players are more. In those days, only two, three companies were there. Now, multiple companies are there. Just go to the train station, you'll see different bottles of water and priced uh, very uh, lower compared to the previous years. But still, it's not affordable. You cannot drink uh, six, seven liters a day uh, just buying water from, from these uh, players. Okay, So think about that. Um, and is it affordable is a big question. Economy. Is adequate water available to sustain livelihoods of rural people? OK, so economic activities also go around water. For example, your agricultural, your uh, clothing industry, dyeing industry, your um, uh, other industries like car, even cars use a lot of water, paper industry, etc. OK, are there enough water for food? energy production, it could be hydropower or even your coal plants where water is needed as a coolant, industries, transport, tourism, etc. So all these economic activities which are needing the water, is there enough water is the question. And that defines water security. If you say that only some sectors are gaining water and some sectors are losing, losing miserably, then that is not water security. Ecosystems. We've already defined ecosystem. I will define it or refresh it again. So ecosystem consists of um, the entire um, area or a location where you have good interactions between the biotic, which is your biological activity and abiotic together is called an ecosystem. Okay. So ecosystem is a kind of a system, an area as I defined it. Uh, so they'll ask, what is the ecosystem of this area? So I would say that there's rocks and within the rocks, there is rabbits, uh, worms, and then trees grow. Uh, and then there's a river running around, uh, which all contribute to the ecosystem. It is not just how the biological activities interact, which is the, the earthworm, the water, the trees, plants, no. It also includes the abiotic, which is the rocks, soil, etc. So all this taken into one system is called ecosystem. And is adequate water available for both biotic and abiotic systems in the region? And does it aid for sustaining nature? Because when you say nature, your rock is also nature. The living thing is also nature. Okay? So this is how ecosystem word uh, derives from. Uh, you cannot just say, no, my nature is just a rabbit. Okay, the rabbit needs a burrow, the rabbit needs a hole to go in and, and uh, sleep uh, and, and have, uh, uh, you know, uh, food, uh, where the food they get, all these things. So you cannot disconnect just the biological or living life form um, in a system and say that is the ecosystem. It, it is a combination of all. Okay, so that is, is there enough water available for all? I'll give you an example. Your water goes through the soil. If the soil is not getting enough water, it's very, very dry, like a clay soil. At one point, it will repel the water, okay? So you might have enough water, but your soil is not taking the water. And because of that, your plants are not getting water. And because of that, your uh, birds, uh, uh, insects, worms, snakes, animals, rats, nothing is growing. Okay, so that is where the ecosystem services come. That is where the ecosystem plays a vital role. Is there enough water for sustaining ecosystems? The last one is resilience, which is very, very important in this era because of climate change. So climate change is happening and uh, the extremes, let's, let me talk only about the extremes. The extremes means very high temperature and very dry weather, no rainfall or very high temperature and flood, or it can be the very cold temperature and no rainfall or cold temperature and high rainfall in floods. So if you just take the water aspect, it is either there's a big, big floods or big, big droughts. Is water enough during climate change to adapt or resilient means to manage during the crisis? Okay. Let's think about um, the COVID situation also. So there are a lot of people who got really affected by COVID. They closed their shops, 
uh, they could not uh, sustain the livelihood, whereas others flourished. Okay, so uh, there is an imbalance, and that is not okay for the whole security of this nation. So in water also, it's the same thing. During the drought, uh, some people might have uh, access to groundwater and they will be happy, they'll take the water put it for agriculture use, whereas some farmers will not have water. Same thing on the opposite. During the floods, uh, some farmers are okay, they won't even uh, farm the land and they'll say, okay, next year I will uh, take the profit out. But is that available, luxury available for all the farmers? Because most of the farmers may not have that luxury. So. Resilience is very, very important to climate change. How you combat it, how you um, are resilient to water-related hazards uh, and pollution. Pollution is also picking up during climate change is very important. So all this defines water security. In short, do you have enough drinking water for all? Do you have water to sustain economic activity, including agriculture, industries, etc.? Do you have water for the ecosystem services, which is running water between uh, your rocks, your groundwater, your base flow, etc., and for the birds, uh, animals, etc.? And is water enough for your uh, resili resilience to climate change? For example, dams store a lot of water, groundwater uh, stores a lot of um, um, water under the ground, the aquifers, I'm saying. Uh, so the groundwater aquifers store a lot of water under the ground, which can be used during both the floods and droughts. So these are resilience to climate change. Is there enough water in that is the question. Okay, so uh, of this, I also mentioned capacity building. Capacity building is building up of uh, people's skills that can address to a particular problem. Okay, uh, I cannot have people alone without the skills and call it capacity. So capacity means I should have enough number of people uh, for a particular work. Uh, and those people should be trained in that particular work to help me out. And that is capacity building. So rural water management requires a holistic point view. Holistic means bringing all these four or five players, which I discussed in the previous slide. Uh, it is not only for agriculture, not only for domestic uh, or uh, not only for forest, etc. It has to bring everything into the picture. And bringing everything means I need capacity in sub uh, regions, like for example, forest, uh, water requirement, agriculture, water requirement, economy, water requirement. All this has to be tied together. However, our agencies are in isolation. And this is not only in India. I'm just giving an example here. But if you look at around the globe, um, for some reason, water is being divided into sub-agencies and those agencies don't talk to each other. They don't manage it together. They manage it differently. These people manage it differently. And at the end, the public are the ones which are getting affected. For example, let's say the Ministry of Water Resources there, there's a Ministry of Jal Shakti, uh, only looking at uh, drinking water supply, pipe water supply. And then there's a Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, which looks at only agriculture water uh, and then forest and climate change, which looks at the ecosystem of water. And then there is water for fishes, animal husbandry and dairy. Uh, so you see that how one water, which comes from the precipitation, is being divided into sections. And for example, if Ministry of Agriculture says, no, I want to put uh, large, large check dams, large irrigation dams to store the water, then there will be you know, not enough water for climate change and uh, environment and forest. Because below the the um, uh, dam, all the forests are going to lose water and also above the dam because the water gets inundated. Okay, so all these agencies have to talk together and that requires also capacity. Therefore, there's a need to build capacity across agencies, not only within agencies. So that is also good and is needed. I need a lot of people to work on pipe water supply for Jal Shakti, but they should also know what is groundwater. They should also know what is um, um, the water related to agriculture and, and uh, farmers so that they manage it properly. Okay, So just giving one source might deplete another uh, major, major source uh, for another ministry, and that should not happen. So all this can be taken care of if the water balance approach is used initially in the study, and all of them actually look at this in a single holistic picture. And that is what the government is doing now, at least in the Manrega. 
So uh, the MG uh, NREGS, which is also uh, known, well known for uh, the 100 days scheme for farmers. So the uh, minimum wage is given to farmers for 100 days so that they don't leave the farmers land or they don't migrate. Okay, so um, it is, it is uh, uh, just initially started with migrations. How do you stop migration? Just pay them 100 days uh, labor in the village and they will stay for the whole year. But slowly, the money is now being also used. So when, they, when they're there for 100 years, I'm sorry, 100 days, they can also be used to work on water conservation projects. And that is where natural resource management, NRM works have started. Uh, and that takes a big chunk, okay, big chunk out of the MGNR Regas budget. So every year the government gives a budget for MG Narega. Um, the names differ. It says N, N Narega, MG Narega, MG uh, NREGS. All these are uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the same um, uh, name would come for um, in different uh, uh, sources. For example, N Rega is there, and then you have Manrega, MG NREGS. Okay, so it's all the same. So for just now, we'll say that it is the scheme that the government has started for keeping people in the villages, preventing them from migrating. And for that, 100 days labor cost is given. Every year it increases. Okay. So if you look at the budget that they give, every year it increases. And almost 60 to 75% of that budget is now allocated for people to work on water conservation or natural resource management. And of the natural resource management, water is very, very key. For example, they'll say, okay, I'm giving you this money. Uh, please work on uh, desilting a tank, making the buns stronger for uh, uh, percolation ponds or recharge pits. And if you look at the budget, it is uh, in 2014-15, it was 18,000 crores, which is around 60 to 75% of the Mandrega budget. Um, and it has been rising uh, uh, very, very steadily. And in the recent data, it is around uh, 59,000 crores per year. Okay, and that is spread across uh, India. So if, uh, in, in those days when the scheme was announced, um, they would just, uh, you know, uh, take the money and then uh, stay in the village, but not much work was done. Because at that time, there's no work, you know, like the agriculture activity is not there. But now uh, the government has realized that you can use it for natural resource management. And they put a lot of money for uh, creating these water uh, structures for the village. The mission water conservation under the NRM compound of Manrega has also um, um, been promoted um, so that they work more on water conservation works under the NRM. As I said, natural resource management can also include your uh, forest, your, your um, um, deepening of rivers, streams, etc. But most importantly, now they're looking at full water conservation works, groundwater, surface water, etc. So that there is a need for cross-cutting theme capacities. It is not just water, it is uh, water for agriculture. It is also rural water for ecosystem and livelihoods, domestic use and sanitation. Sanitation is a very important part for rural water management. Uh, because there's one scheme where there is building toilets for, for rural villages, but if there's no water in the toilet, how will they use it if there's no connection of pipe supply? So that is uh, how you should build water across the themes. Um, um, very uh, directly saying that water is very key for livelihoods, your food, and also cl saying clean uh, sanitation, etc. So it is very important to have all these subsectors understood and capacity built for it. For example, if I say I'm going to do rural water management and I only care about agriculture, I don't care about climate change, then what happens? When a big drought happens, your agriculture fails. Same thing, your, if I don't care about your ecosystem, uh, forest, everything, I just take all the forest off and convert it to agriculture uh, water. Then what happens? Um, when there's a landslide, all the land is gone. All the soil is gone. So all these different capacities have to be acknowledged first. And there's a cross cutting of themes. It is not only agriculture, it should be agriculture and climate change. How do you have crops that are resilient to climate change? Which means that for example, I have a rice variety which can grow in floods or a rice variety which requires 30% less water. So that will be helpful during a drought. 
So this is how you merge different sectors, agriculture and climate change across water. And this cross cutting is very necessary for moving on with rural water resource management. Not only for rural water resource management, but also to attain the sustainable development goals. A nation is called developed, okay, if they attain all these goals. And most importantly, they have to attain it in a very sustainable fashion. And the sustainability is defined with these 17 goals. Okay, so number one is no poverty. It's not like your, your GDP is high, but still people are begging on the streets. Is that considered sustainable development? No, it's a section of the society which is developed. The other section is not. So uh, how do you define sustainable development is no poverty should exist. Let's take a village and half the village is very rich, half the village is poor, doesn't make, even though the average salary is high, it's skewed. Okay, statistically it is skewed because part of the society is having five times the income. So that doesn't um, equate to uh, a sustainable development. That's what this goal says. Zero hunger, no hunger, no one should die of hunger, no one should have um, no food during uh, any part of the three times meal. Um, and then your um, uh, health, your gender equity, clean water, sanitation, all these are there, 17 goals. What you find clearly is water is tied across all these uh, sustainable goals, one way or the other. For example, if a farmer doesn't get water, they end up in poverty. So water is very important for a farmer. Okay, So gender equity, but very directly, it is related to number six, Okay, uh, clean water and sanitation, and then life uh, of aquatic water, life under the water, uh, and then your life on land and water, all these things. So to attain all this, it is very important to have a collaborative cross-cutting uh, capacity to understand how much water is needed for agriculture, how much water is needed for economic activity, sanitation, and then build a system for everything. Let's take a tank, for example, for rural water management. If I build a tank and I say that the tank only supplies water for um, agriculture, then what happens to the um, dairy uh, water? Uh, if there's no water, how will they survive? If there is no water for sanitation, how are they going to be clean? So every single part should be acknowledged. And if it cannot be done, for example, uh, I can only have water for agricultural fields, not for chicken farm, then some kind of alternative should be suggested for that. Like no chicken farms, but you can do this kind of farming. Okay, so some promotion, some subsidies uh, may be given to uh, take the water out. Same thing with the dams. In a dam, you are stopping the water and then storing the water for hydropower, for example. But you are stopping the water from going down, which people and animals and birds might need it. So there should be some balance saying that, okay, even though I store the water, I'm going to release some water there, or I'm going to build a smaller tank there for you to have water during the um, non-monsoon season. So those kind of things should be well thought of and acknowledged when you make these sustainable development plans. More importantly, the agency should talk together because water is a cross-cutting theme and all should work together for rural water resource management. With this, I will conclude today's lecture. I will see you in the next lecture. Thank you.